we have already received today. Thanks to Elijah and to Karen and to the choir for blessing us. Good morning, church. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Um, I, some of you know that I was out week before last for uh, intensive for my doctor of ministry program, and I did successfully defend my dissertation. So thank you for your love and your prayers and your support. And I will tell you that my work has so strengthened and nurtured my faith and my work and even the message I'm going to share today. It has been a blessing and truly thank you. And I wanted to come thank you all last week and then I got the flu. As Nick said, I, got, I brought it from Ohio. So I'm trying really hard not to pass that on, but I feel great now and I'm through that. But um, thank you all and what a joy to be back with you today. Well, I have a question for you this morning. You ready? Are you battle ready? Hmm. Deep thinking this morning. Are you battle ready? And let's be real, do we want to be battle ready? Sometimes we're like, can we opt out of the battle? Is there another option? I don't know if I want to be battle ready. And I, I get it, my friends. I get it. And God does provide times of, of peace. I think that's part of why we love Psalm 23, right? That God brings these times of provision and, and protection and rest. But we've also noticed that it's hard to escape the battle around us, isn't it? Even when we try to opt out, it opts us in. And so there is a spiritual battle. What does it take to be battle ready? And some of us may, may say, no, I, I'm just battle weary this morning. Anybody feeling battle weary? Gone through disappointment, through hardship, through grief, through loss. We've been there, haven't we? We know what it is to be weary and to be worn out. And if that's what you're feeling today, I just want you to know you are not alone. You are not alone. And it's okay to be battle weary, okay? Um, but even in the, in the same moment, God can prepare us to be battle ready. And I'm not saying that we're people that are looking for a fight. Um, different personalities are wired different ways. We don't have to be looking for a fight to be faithful, but we want to be discerning to see when the fight is already there. And we want to refuse to close our eyes to it. We want to refuse to be too comfortable or too apathetic when God is calling us to join him in the mission field. Amen? And so sometimes we are called to battle. And we'll look at a passage that talks about that today. But I just want to say... That for those friends who are feeling a little weary, that's okay too. And God can heal our hearts. God can nurture our souls. And we can heal even while we're suiting up, okay, in the armor of God. And both can happen at the same time. So what does it take to be battle ready? To be ready for spiritual battle? I'm not saying go and just start a battle with your neighbors. <laughs> That's not what we're saying today. And some are like, oh, shucks. <laughs> um, we're not talking about battling people. And this world would love for us to just battle each other all the time, right? Our 24-7 hour, 24 news cycle would like for us to battle each other all the time, right? And there are a lot of people that would gladly tell us who all of our enemies are. And they want us to have a lot of enemies. And I think it's time to have fewer enemies and, and realize who the real enemies are. And, and we aren't each other's enemies. Amen? And those outside the church aren't our enemies. And those who think differently and vote differently from us are not our enemies. And so being battle ready is recognizing where is the fight and have we been spending our energy on the wrong fights? Mm. So we recognize that there's a spiritual battle. And this is what we refer to when we use the word spiritual warfare. Now, some people love the term spiritual warfare, and some are like, spiritual what? I don't know if I want to be part of that. And spiritual warfare is a serious reality. I don't throw it around lightly. I find that some people just like, just like to throw the word out. Doing spiritual warfare. I'm like, really? 
If we're really doing spiritual warfare, we've got to take it seriously. Truly, we need to take it seriously, and, and I do not take it lightly. And we need to be suited up in the armor of God before we try to do that. We don't want to go out to battle or to fight the spiritual battles around us without being grounded in what God has for us. We don't want to do that in our own strength. So we recognize that there's a spiritual battle. Now, um, we just spent how many days watching a spy balloon up in the air and debating whether or not to shoot it down? Anybody been watching that? The spy balloon, and for those online, the memes are priceless of the spy balloon. Uh, I know that's not super spiritual, but it's really funny. So um, uh, we're reminded again and again of the political tensions in our world, aren't we? And, and we see the signs of political tensions. My friends, do we see the signs of spiritual tensions all around us? Do we see the signs? Discernment is needed. Discernment is needed to see what's going on. How many times have you talked with somebody and the presenting problem isn't the real problem? How many times have you been angry about something and the little thing you're angry about isn't the real problem? We need to be discerning about ourselves, about what's under the surface and fueling that agitation and aggravation and be discerning in the world as well what is stirring up the hornet's nest in our world and in our families and in our communities and sometimes it's spiritual. Now am I saying that every problem has a spiritual root? I'm actually not. Um, there's, a num there's layers of problems in our world. And, and I, I want to be really direct here. Sometimes if there is a physical need and all we do is pray about it, when we have the resources to help it, do you think we're missing the boat? So we see there are physical needs, there are economic needs, there are educational needs, there are relational needs, there are emotional needs, and there are spiritual needs. And we need to be discerning to see what the source of the problem is, but also to re realize that sometimes it's multi-layered, that there's layers of problems, and we have to work together using the gifts we have, that if you solve one problem, there may still be another. And yes, sometimes there are spiritual roots to physical problems. Is this making sense? We need to pray, and we need to be discerning, and we need to work together. Because sometimes, let's say physical needs that we share, whether it's illness or loss of job, there's a very real financial need there. There's a very real physical need. But have you ever found that those needs break you down until there's an inner emotional need? And so we want to look at the layers of how healing can be brought to those situations. Spiritual realities. And are we looking for the spiritual realities that are um, layered in with what we're facing? The passage that we're looking at today comes from a book that a number of us were reading last month. Um, it's on dynamite prayer. Did anybody really get into dynamite prayer, dunamis prayer? And this is how God enables us by the power of his spirit to pray in more powerful ways. And the passage that was in, I think, day 24 of our reading was Ephesians 6. I love this passage because it stretches us. I love the hard passages that just stretch us. I'm not going to apologize. They're so good for us. They're so good for us. And so um, we'll come to the whole verse in a minute. But this is the, the passage that talks about the armor of God. Now, how many of us have heard of that phrase? putting on the armor of God. And sometimes we don't really dig in to see what it means. And in that passage, it talks about the spiritual battle that we deal with as we're dealing with the, the devil's schemes or the wiles of the devil. Do you remember hearing that? And we really have to consider, do we believe that? And we're going to read it in just a minute about the spiritual forces of wickedness that we're dealing with. Um, we're going to read about the, the schemes of the enemy, of the devil. And my Methodist friends, I want to ask you, do you believe that what God's word says is true? Do we believe that we have a spiritual enemy? Now, I've done a good bit of research on all the reasons that people don't believe that anymore and why Christians don't believe this anymore. And a big reason is enlightenment thinking, enlightenment skepticism, enlightenment rationalism that just seeped into our culture. And we've been raised with it until how many wear glasses? I really should be now. I just refuse to. 
I keep losing them. But, but right, the lenses that we see through affect our reality. And so if you're using an old prescription, you don't see very well, do you? And the reality is our culture becomes a lens through which we see. And sometimes we try to read scripture, but we're reading through it, reading it through a humanistic viewpoint or a rationalistic viewpoint that has come through our culture. Does that make sense? And so it's, it's wise to step back and go, I'm reading this in scripture, do I believe it? And if I don't believe it, why is that? What are the lenses that I'm reading through scripture that tells me to dismiss what God's word says? And so when we read about this spiritual enemy, Satan, um, it's very tempting to go, oh, they just weren't as smart as us back then. Um, they just didn't know all the things that we know today because we're modern people. And that's kind of, kind of the attitude. And, and we say we want to be like Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. We want to have faith in Jesus. Jesus believed all these things. Jesus literally cast out demons. And so I really want to say, are we smarter than Jesus? And so I just begin by just saying, I understand that some of us are going to read this passage and go, ooh, can we just get that pastor to the next passage? I know, but no. <laughs> We're going to read this passage. And if you struggle with it or wrestle with it, talk with God and say, God, what are the lenses I'm looking through? How, would you, how can you give me your lenses to read your word so that it makes sense to me and so I have faith to believe it? All right? That's just kind of a bonus. But sometimes we need to talk about it based on the world that we're living in. So we're going to look at Ephesians. Chapter 6, verses, we'll start with verses 10 through 12, and we'll read this passage in two parts. And so we read, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor. Does it say the partial armor? No. Does it say a piece of the armor? Does it say the part of the armor you can find that day? <laughs> Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand... You know I had to do that when we say take your stand against the what? The devil schemes. All right, next verse. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Whoo, amen, amen. All right, that is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And we'll go on to the next passage in just a few minutes. But I want to just revisit those verses for a moment. We'll start with verse 10, which says to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And that word be strong could be translated um, be empowered. And this is actually, some of y'all are going to love this, is connected with the word dunamis that we've been studying for the month. The word is endunamusthe. I had to work hard on that one. Thank you, Nick. <sighs> y'all know this is his area, but I can break out the Greek when I need to. <laughs> endunamusthe. And that is um, a verbal form of dunamis. So be empowered. Be dynamite empowered. And the, the concept here is not that you're just being strong in your own strength. If you ever just white knuckled something, you're just going to get through it in your own strength. It's not that what's going on here. We're being empowered by the power of God. It's not our own strength, but it's God's strength. And so everything that follows from this verse is not about us just bucking up buttercup and trying harder, but it's about us receiving the power and the provision of God. Amen? Do y'all hear that? So if you're getting nervous, you don't have to do this in your own power and strength. Verse 11 says, and we can go back to verse 11 so you can see it on the screen as well. Um, Put on the full armor of God to stand against the devil's schemes. Do we realize that we have an enemy who doesn't like us very much? We have an enemy who doesn't like us very much. Um, ben Witherington, um, a theologian and professor, writes of this passage and he says, Mention of the schemes of the devil reminds us of the trickery by which evil and temptation pre present themselves in our lives. Get ready for this one. Evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. 
It is baited in a camouflage trap. So we've got to be watching for the wiles, the trickery of the enemy. And just because we go, oh, I think it's fine. Eh, it's fine. Is it fine? Are we discerning and praying about what we're participating in? Moving on to verse 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The dynamics of our world will pit us against each other. Have you noticed that? And it's so easy to get offended. Ooh, somebody says something online. Somebody says something in earshot. And, oh, I, I've been offended. I, y'all, I, I, I've been there. I've done that. It is miserable to be offended. And it hurts our hearts. And, and it's easy to say, well, those people, that person, that type of group. And we really have to watch that we don't make enemies out of one another. What if we started to realize who our real enemy is? And if we would take the bullseye off of each other, if we would take the target off of each other, off of people, and realize who the enemy is and stop fighting one another. Now, can the enemy use human beings for his purposes? Yeah. If I'm real, I would say he's probably used me before to say something that wasn't nice or have a thought that's unkind and ungracious, and I have to repent of that. Does that make sense? So yeah, sometimes we can participate in the schemes of the enemy. We can get pulled in. We can get roped in to the battle that the enemy wants us to play and to fight against each other. But God's calling us to say, oh, no, I don't think so. I'm not playing your game. You're not my friend, and I'm not going to play it your way. And so we want to realize who our true enemy is. Do we recognize that a spiritual battle is raging? And I want you to ask yourself that today. And do we get to the point where we can discern when that is in our own hearts? That's when it gets really real. It's one thing to point out there and go, oh, man, it's bad. But when do we say, oh, Lord, heal me, forgive me, cleanse me, prepare me? Sometimes the battle's within, and sometimes it's spiritual. And we want God to prepare us and make us aware. That's why one reason as a Methodist, we believe strongly in holiness. But holiness starts within, not with pointed fingers. And I think even discerning the battle, discerning where that battle is in us before we try to fix other people's part in the battle. You hear me? So Paul is telling us to put on this spiritual armor. And it's fascinating because he um, wants us to put on the full spiritual battle. Let's move on to verse 13 and read the remainder of this passage. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand... Stand firm then, and now he's going to tell all the pieces of the armor of God with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of what? Peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. It's a big shield. I'll get there in a minute. With which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Amen. And by the way, did I just act that out? Did it look goofy? I don't care. Because it helps me to feel that it's real. It helps me to think about each one. Now, the things we're talking about are spiritual realities. They're not physical things that we're putting on. But when I read it out loud, it gets in my ears and it gets in my heart. When I even move around, that's how I pray. I know y'all want me to pray like this. I don't. I walk around. And sometimes if you come early to church, I might be walking around. I, I'm going to keep doing it. But there's something about... Acting out, putting on those pieces that helps it make sense. So when we talk about the full armor of God, it is not a mantra that we have to read every day to ourselves in order to keep things from going wrong. It's not a magical incantation. And I've known folks who read it every day, and I think there is value to that because when we read it, it's real. So there is value to reading it. But more than just reading it, we want to 
to initiate it and to intentionally take on those pieces of armor. This is the armor that we see that God has. Um, We see in the Old Testament that you see God wearing pieces of armor and then we're told to to wear similar pieces of armor. It's so interesting. So the verb that we see here in verse 13, to put on, this is used also in Ephesians 4.24. If anybody loves to study, write that down and go look it down, look it up later. But in Ephesians 24, we're also told to put something on. And so this is Paul writing through the big book of Ephesians. And when you see him repeat a word, you want to notice what he's repeating. And so in Ephesians 4, he says, take off the old self and put on the new self. And then when we read about putting on the armor of God, we can connect that with putting on the new self, putting on God-like character. In fact, in Ephesians 4.24, we read, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we put off the old self and we put on this new self. We, we see in other places in scripture, put on Christ. So when we put on the armor of God, we're putting on the character of God, the way of God, the way of Jesus. And I know we often say, be like Jesus, but when we really think about it, we go, what does that mean? Does it just mean try hard and be nice? Scripture tells us so much more about what it means to be like Jesus. And I would say that putting on the full armor of God is a revelation of what it means to follow Jesus. We want to dig deep into what it means to put on the armor of God. And so when we're putting on the full armor, we want the whole thing, right? We don't want to just do pieces. Uh, We don't go, what am I in the mood to wear today? The shield of faith, yeah. Breastplate of righteousness, eh. No, it, it's not optional. It's, it's not mixing and matching which ones you want to wear. It's the full armor, not the partial armor. It's all essential. It's not optional. You hearing that? And so have you ever gone, guys, you may not get this. I don't know. I'm sorry. But, but do you ever go into a, a store and you see a full outfit on a mannequin? And you're like, oh, that looks good. And I love clothes, I love shoes, I love pretty things, but I'm not good at putting them together. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, I'm not. Sometimes I'm so thankful to wear this robe so I don't have to think about what I'm wearing. It is the truth. It is hard to figure out what to wear. Guys just have like the, they can wear the same thing. You're like, that's fine. But women, we have all these expectations. And so I look at the mannequin, I'm like, can I just take the whole thing? Just all of that. Whoever put that together, nice. Just put that on me. Jewelry, that too. Like, that's really how I should live my life. Um, I, I need help in that area. That's the same from the armor of God. God is saying, here it is. This is what you need. And we're supposed to be going, yeah, I think I'll take all of it. Okay? So put the whole thing on. So we want to talk for just a a brief few minutes about these different things that we're putting on. If we go back to verse 13, I'm not going to read them all. I just want you to have them up there. In verse 13, we're told to stand our ground. And can we be real? Are any of us running? Are any of us hiding? Are any of us just done? And this is not stand your ground in a, in a selfish or fleshly way, but standing your ground as you wear the armor of God. And um, many people have noted this, but something you notice when you read about the armor of God, it's all on the front. So if you turn and run, what happens? You become vulnerable. And so you've got to stand your ground. And if any of us are running today just trying to hide from the realities in our world. I'll tell you, we're vulnerable if we turn and run. So stand your ground. Verse 14 talks about the belt of truth. We're grounded in God's truth, and we speak that truth in love. Amen? Ground ourselves in God's truth and speak it in love. Um, Then it goes on to talk about, in verse 14, the breastplate of righteousness. And so we live in the righteousness of Christ, right? Does righteousness come more easily for Jesus than for us? Yeah, it does. But we get to participate in it. We get to participate in it. And so if we say we have on the breastplate of righteousness, but we're intentionally doing things that are not righteous, we've put down the breastplate. 
I, I have to say that really strongly because as a Methodist, we truly believe that we need to share and live out and obey what Jesus tells us to do and what scripture tells us to do. So if we are intentionally doing things which Jesus would not do or which scripture tells us not to do, then we're going, I want the breastplate of righteousness, but not that much. And am I saying we have to be perfect all the time? No, we're putting on Christ's righteousness. But, but have you ever had someone send you mixed signals? I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you. You say really nice things and want to be my friend, but then you do things behind my back. Sometimes we send God mixed signals and we can't tell whether we want to wear that breastplate of righteousness or not. And so we do need to obey God's word and to be open to God showing us when we're out of alignment with his will and his heart. Does that make sense? Just be open to that. And then we have verse 15, <clears throat> the shoes of the gospel of peace. And the gospel is good news. Are we sharing good news? Some people think it that God has called them to share bad news. I don't want that assignment. And if we're really eager to share bad news um, that that's, um, would push people away from God, now, it, do we ever, let's be real, do we ever hear truth and go, ooh, that's hard to hear? Yes. But even the truth that's hard to hear is good news because it calls us into deeper relationship with God. Do we get that? And so we, we speak the truth and we lean into the truth and we remember that God's truth is always good news and it leads us to love and it's a good news of peace. When we are pulled into a spiritual battle, it is so easy to take on the attitude and spirit of those around us and forget, forget that we carry a message of peace. And so even when we're engaged in a spiritual battle, we are living out peace can we hold those two together in tension? And if we become too riled up in anger and agitation and aggravation, we have forfeited the gospel of peace. So are we wearing that gospel of peace? Um, and here's a thought. One thing that you learn in, in spiritual warfare is this. Sometimes we have to act with the opposite spirit or attitude of what we're surrounded with. If you, have you ever entered a room and you can just feel the chaos or the anxiety? And have you ever noticed that you can just soak it up and all of a sudden you're chaotic and you're anxious? How do you go and be the calmest person in the room, right? You act in the opposite spirit. And that's not just emotional, but it's spiritual. If you are in a world that is taking up arms to shoot one another, then instead we promote a gospel of peace. We speak against and contrary to the spirit or attitude of our age that would cause harm. That's really powerful if we can get that. And that could be a whole message in itself. Then we take up in verse 16, the shield of faith. Oh, this is good. You ready? Okay. You'll nod. Tell me you're ready. Okay. At the time, the Roman shields were big. They weren't baby shields. Do you ever feel like your shield of faith is this big? <laughs> <laughs> no, they were like the size of a door. They were meant to cover all of you. Did you get that? Yeah. We don't have to supplement with other shields. The shield of faith is enough. And in the Roman world, remember that Paul was imprisoned in a house. He was under house arrest. And so he's watching these Roman guards and connecting what he's seeing on their armor, right? As well as what he sees in scripture. But their, their um, shield was big. And not only was it big, but it would put out flaming darts. And so it was leather, but then it had um, like water on it. And so when somebody shot you, not only was it supposed to bounce off that shield, but it was also supposed to, to put out the flaming arrow. Okay, I'm so excited about this. And y'all are just staring at me like, next point, Blossom. This is really good. So you've got your shield of faith, like it's a big shield. And the arrows come at you and they're lit up with fire. And it goes out when it, heals the, it hits the faith. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. <laughs> But I, I got to acknowledge, let's be real, even though we have a big old shield of faith, when the arrow is coming and it's on fire, what do we feel? Fear. 
And what are we tempted to do when the arrow is coming? And again, if you forgot, it is on fire and it's coming our way. She like my acting that out. Yeah. And what happens when we turn around? We're exposed. So y'all, I know the arrow's coming. And I know it's on fire. But stand firm. Do you feel that? I don't know what's coming at you today. But I know it's some hard things. And I'm sorry. Sometimes I'm tempted to try to jump in front of you and shield you. And I've had to repent of that lately. I'm not your shield. Nick and I carry a lot of love for y'all as, as your pastors and as your shepherds. But we're not the good shepherd. And I'm really working to get out of the way and let God. And remember that it's the shield of faith. And some of y'all are like me. You want to fix all the things. Anybody else? Or control the situation or protect all the people. But my friends, they need a shield of faith more than they need you. Okay? So carry that shield of faith. Oh, that's so good. So good. I told y'all y'all were going to like that one. See? Just have faith. Stand strong in faith. Verse 17, a helmet of salvation. And so, whereas the breastplate of righteousness covers our heart, the helmet of salvation covers our mind. Do you ever feel like you need something to cover your mind? And so this this helmet of salvation, of course, is about our salvation in Christ, but it can even apply to just salvation from that fiery dart coming your way and trusting that God will stand in the gap and will work and will help you. Whatever the situation, our salvation comes from God. And finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is foundational. That is the sword. And did you realize that most of these elements of the armor were defensive and not offensive I'm not telling Mar- Maria knows all this she's done a whole series on this but it's I'm not telling you to go out there and swagger out and go devil I'm coming for you I'm going to pick a fight sometimes I think people think that's what spiritual warfare is we're not picking fights but when he picks a fight we stand firm when he's picking out our loved ones in our community, we stand firm. And so these are more defensive than offensive. But that sword would be the one that could be offensive, although it could be defensive as well. And so it is the word of God. Are we reading God's word so we know his character? We cannot participate in the spiritual battle if we don't know God's heart and God's will. We've got to know his heart and God's will. We've got to know God's character. How many of us say, I have such a hard time praying because I'm always afraid I'm praying against God's will? Anybody? Anybody? I'll give you the cheat sheet. This is the cheat sheet. And the Holy Spirit will guide us in those prayers. And if you pray something from Scripture for your loved ones, for yourself, for your community, and for some reason that isn't the specific plan, God's not going to go, oh my goodness, Blossom prayed Scripture. I'm so mad at her. I think we think we're going to get in real trouble. Pray Scripture and see where God leads you. We have the cheat sheet. This is God's character. This is God's heart. And that's how we participate in this battle. And if you follow on after the text, it talks about praying continuously. Prayer is crucial and key for the spiritual battle. So as we bring this to a close, I just want to, to read aloud very simply the different pieces of armor. And we want to ask the Holy Spirit to nudge us if there's a piece of armor that we've let drop or that we forgot about or that we shoved in a corner, okay? And you don't have to tell your neighbor which one it is, okay? This is for you and God. So, Lord, what is it? As as you're preparing us to be battle ready, what are the pieces of armor that we've laid aside or forgotten or we've been so wounded that we're self-protecting and we've dropped it, okay? Is it the belt of truth? Are we grounded in God's truth and speaking the truth in love? Is it the breastplate of righteousness? Is it the shoes of the gospel of peace? Is it the shield of faith? 
the helmet of salvation? What are the things that maybe we've forgotten or lost track of or that we're so focused on protecting or turning or running or hiding that we lost it? Because God provided it to protect us and to bless us. So we're going to enter into a time of prayer that leads us to holy.